Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to a new edition of Human Conversations. As you know, I'm Jessica Lockhart. I am the director of the International Institute of Humanology, and I'm thrilled to be here one more month to discuss a human topic. As you know, the Institute organizes different events around one topic every month, a topic chosen by our followers and the members of our Institute. And the topic chosen for this month of October is none other than forgiveness, a very important topic for human beings. And if you don't agree, I am sure our experts today will convince you otherwise, because we're going to be talking about the fundamental importance of forgiveness. I am really thrilled to introduce the speakers that are going to be with me today. Remember that you will be able to ask your questions and participate, join our conversation later on after the presentations have been made and our prepared questions have been already answered. So get ready to type in your questions and your messages on our YouTube channel. The first speaker that I am really, really happy to introduce tonight is Lori Crowley. We happened to meet while we were both living in Bern, Switzerland and have somehow followed one another throughout the years. I know that uh, she went back to the US where she is originally from and is now a California resident who holds a master's degree in counseling psychology with a holistic somatic emphasis. She is a dedicated mother to four, including an angel child and three remarkable adult children with varying neurodivergence who help her deepen her understanding daily. Lori, Proudly identifies as neurodivergent and is the founder of EXP Therapy, where she supports families navigating autism and other forms of neurodivergence. Doris also shares her experiences and mentorship as a life coach. Her coaching organization, Reframe Coaching, empowers individuals to reshape their lived experiences and break limiting paradigms. As part of this important work, Lori co-created and passionately advocates for the globally recognized Ability Awareness Program, celebrating diversity and shared challenges. She's also a devoted ally to the LGBTQIA2S+, neuroqueer and transgender communities, promoting acceptance and understanding. Lori's life work embodies inclusivity, holistic well-being, and celebrates diversity, impacting countless lives. As you can imagine, what Lori is going to be sharing with us tonight might be extremely inspiring, so be ready for it. Lori, thank you for being here. I'm so happy to have you on board our Human Conversations. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jessica. So now you have five minutes to talk about the importance, the fundamental importance of forgiveness. Lori, the floor is yours. Thank you. You know, when Jessica reached out to ask if I would be interested in participating um, in this conversation this evening, I found the topic of forgiveness to be just such an important and profound um, notion that we really, as a world, have to engage in. Um, having lived through some very interesting global times in the last three, five years between pandemic and political upturn and now um, extreme aggression in, in the form of, of uh, military and, and terrorist activities. It just feels more and more important that we find a platform and a format to be able to have really difficult discussions. And I think so often these things come from grievances. They come from not being seen. They come from not being uh, honored and appreciated. And when we begin to talk about the topic of forgiveness, I think it's very interesting because I can remember as a child being told, you know, forgive and forget you know, forgive and forget. And um, I don't think that those two things are the same. I don't think they necessarily go together. And so I think it's really an interesting paradigm that we have to think about when we think about this concept of forgiving, forgiveness. How am I going to show up in the world? There are several things that I think are really critical 
to our ability to be able to forgive. Um, and I don't think we want to forget. I think that's part of the problem. And I think people think that in order to forgive that you end up forgetting. So how we hold some of these things, how we come up with appropriate vocabulary, um, I think really support our ability to live in a more, I'm trying to find the right word because it's just such a, it's, you know, a, a, in a more harmonious way. It's not to say that we'll always be in harmony, but if we could find a way to be a little more harmonious, I think that we could, could really benefit from that. Um, the communities that I serve um, represent marginalized communities who have some really challenging lived experiences and that those, those things often have so many transgressions that come along with it. And, you know, when we have been wronged, we defend ourselves and it's how we survive. And so being able to sort of untangle the web, the knot of our lived experiences, how those things show up, how our neurology um, navigates it. Um, these are the things that I that I spend a lot of time trying to help uh, my my clients with, um, how how we make errors as parents, as community members, as human beings. Um, and then how we can go back and repair. And I think that so much of the repair is missing. So yeah, that's, that's just a, a quick moment, but happy to be here and really excited for the discussion tonight. Thank you so much, Lori. Forgive and forget. Something that I think all of us heard in our childhood and uh, that will be for sure part of the discussion today. Thank you so much, Lori. Let me now introduce the second speaker. I'm really, really happy to have her with us tonight too. Mavis Tsai, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name properly, is, holds a PhD and is a clinical psychologist and senior research scientist at the University of Washington Center for Science of Social Connection. She is the co-creator of Functional Analytic Psychotherapy, a treatment followed by therapists worldwide that harnesses the power of the therapeutic relationship to transform clients' lives. She is a recipient of Washington State Psychological Association's Distinguished Psychologist Award in recognition of significant contributions to the field of psychology. As founder of the nonprofit organization Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project, she trains volunteers to lead chapters in six continents to create an international network of open hearted change seekers who strive to meet life's challenges through deepening interpersonal connection and rising to live more true to themselves. Again, I am sure that all of you listening to us today will be inspired by her words. Her knowledge and wisdom, as you can see, is wide and deep, and I'm sure she will have a lot of food for thought for us. Mavis, thank you for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Jessica. You're so enthusiastic. I, I love I how think you... it was more like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just love how you talk. Thank so, you. So I actually prepared a brief PowerPoint presentation because your initial ask was, what do you want to say about forgiveness in five minutes? Like, what are, what are your most key thoughts about forgiveness? So I just, I just wanted to write them down. <clears throat> And here is my PowerPoint. I just have a few slides. So here's us. And I love our initial discussion when I first came on about how Lori's name is upside down and that it's because of calling attention to how neurodivergent people might experience the world. So thank you for that, Lori. So what I wanted to say about forgiveness is that it's an intentional decision to let go of anger and hurt towards someone who has harmed you. 
and this graphic on the side here, it's the Chinese word. I'm Chinese American, so I thought, oh, this, I'd like to present about this. The word is pronounced shu, shu. And it literally means a woman speaking openly from her heart. So there, it's a character that actually has three characters in it. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that's my next slide. So on the left, you have this character, which is Nu, and that's woman. And then this one is Ko, which is mouth. And then the one on the bottom is Xing or heart. So I was just very touched by this idea that the Chinese view forgiveness as a woman speaking openly from her heart. So Lori was talking about how we've all heard forgive and forget. And to me, it's so important to recognize that forgiving doesn't mean that you're condoning what happened and it does not obligate you to reconcile. It's very much an internal process, but it can bring you peace of mind by recognizing the pain that you've suffered without letting that pain define you or enabling you. Well, it, it will enable you to move forward with your life if and when you choose to do so. As Jessica was saying, I'm the founder of Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project, and I'm going to be looking at forgiveness from the framework of awareness, courage, and love. So I just wanted to show you that we're, we're in six continents and I interact with people from all over the world. Just like very privileged to do that. And we focus on bringing together global change seekers who want to connect deeply and authentically with both themselves and others and apply passions, their passions to interpersonal and community transformation. So looking at the lens, looking through the lens of awareness, courage, and love, and trying to embrace the path of forgiveness, this is, this is what I came up with, that awareness entails just really deeply delving into your own emotions and your past experiences with tenderness. So somebody has hurt you, and so you're just really looking at your own history and why this is hurting you so much. And it's also using your awareness to understand the history that's influenced the other person's actions. Courage involves confronting our own painful emotions. It takes courage to decide to do that. Often it's a lot easier just to avoid what we're feeling. And it can also involve directly addressing the individual who's caused the hurt. And then love encompasses compassion for both oneself and others. It's underpinned by the deliberate choice to let go of resentment. But love can mean saying yes, and it can also mean saying no. It can mean setting a boundary of, no, this is not going to happen again. And as I was saying, you don't have to choose to reconcile. It can be very loving to just let go of a resentment internally, but set the outward boundary of not of deciding not to interact with the person in the future who has harmed you. I came up with an acronym of, I just, I like acronyms and I thought, okay, forgive. How, how would the letters involved in forgive relate to the actual act of forgiveness. And I want to underscore what I said at the bottom of the slide, which is that while this acronym captures some fundamental aspects of forgiveness, the process is deeply, deeply personal and it can vary for each person. So this acronym serves as a simplified guide and it's not going to apply to everyone. And it really depends on your own process and timing. So F stands for facing the hurt. Before forgiveness can occur, 
we really need to acknowledge and tenderly make space for and grieve the pain, the betrayal or harm that's been caused. I really like what you said, Lori, about how when we've been hurt, we're just, we're not seen, we're not honored, we're not appreciated. And not only that, we've, we've been betrayed in some way. So O stands for opening up to empathy, understanding the feelings, motivations, and actions of the one who caused the harm. And often, or most of the time, we, we can't really open up to our empathy until we've actually faced how we've been wounded. So I'm just, I'm just thinking about how it's important not to engage in spiritual bypassing, which is, oh, we need, we need to just reach for our higher selves and we need to forgive. And, and that's not going to work. I really don't think that will work until you've made room for how much hurt you're experiencing and really honoring your own hurt. So R stands for releasing the resentment. It's, it's making the decision to let go of negative emotions like anger, bitterness, or the desire for revenge. And this can happen. This, this may be a decision that you just have to make or decide to make over and over and over again, because it's not like you can choose to just let go of your anger. And it's a one-time decision. It's likely that you'll keep coming back to the ways that you've been hurt. Uh, G stands for gaining perspective or accepting the reality of what happened trying to view the situation from a broader viewpoint, considering the offender's circumstances, recognizing that everyone makes mistakes, including ourselves. I is the intentional decision that I was referring to before, that forgiveness is an active choice that we make over and over again. It's not just something passive that happens. So it just requires this deliberate decision to keep moving forward. E is valuing reconciliation. While it doesn't need to lead to reconciliation, forgiveness, when it involves the possibility and the valuing of restored relationships, it can be a motivating factor in the forgiveness process. And then finally, E stands for empowerment. Forgiveness can really empower us who decide to forgive by liberating us from the chains of resentment and giving us control over our emotional well-being. There's just a lot of research indicating the benefits of choosing to forgive. So again, this is just something I did for fun to think about the key elements of forgiveness. And it's a very simplistic guide and the actual process is complex and nuanced. I was, did I go over five minutes? I think you did beautifully. Thank you so much Mavis for another very inspiring contribution. I think that we're going to be talking about a lot of the aspects you mentioned in your presentation, in your brief presentation throughout today. And because many of those are sometimes not even considered when talking about forgiveness. And I think it's important that they are. So I will now take up my five minutes to present my own uh, take on the fundamental importance of forgiveness. I'm going to be speaking about forgiveness from two perspectives. The first one is related to what Lori said which is that uh, children were told to forgive and forget. And that's the first thing I want to transmit and, and convey tonight, which is that most societies in the world praise forgiveness, but don't actually teach us how to go about forgiving. We're not taught how to forgive. We're told to forgive. We're told to say you're sorry and then accept, accept the, the, the apology, but that's about it. We're not taught how to go about all the steps that Mavis mentioned in her presentation. And uh, I want to, now in my second idea, I want to focus a little bit on that process. When we teach forgiveness at the Institute, 
we usually explain that most people forgive at one or maximum two levels. There is what we call intellectual forgiveness. That is the process by which you analyze a situation and you decide to forgive because it somehow makes sense. You either find logic in the behavior of the perpetrator or the person who hurt you, even yourself, if you're the one who hurt yourself, or you find some kind of logic in the situation that makes you decide, okay, yeah, it makes sense that I forgive. And then you let the story go. Oftentimes though, that's not enough. And we find ourselves having the story come back to us and make us feel bad, either in anger or rage or guilt as well. So there are cases in which we need what we call emotional forgiveness. That is the type of forgiveness we reach when there are very strong emotions involved that somehow weigh heavier than the logic of the process. There's cases in which we might forgive a person just because we love that person too much to hold a grudge or because our um, feelings for the people who hurt us are so strong that we decide to let go of whatever happened just to keep the relationship strong and going. That is what we would call emotional forgiveness. But we've discovered that there are many cases in which that's not enough either. There are cases in which we're forgiven emotionally and intellectually, and the story still chases us and haunts us, even at night, through nightmares, or during the day when the story comes back and makes us feel bad all over again. When that happens, we say that the reality is that we haven't fully forgiven. To fully forgive, we have to be able to recall the story as if it were an old movie that we're remembering without the emotions happening again, without us feeling hurt or guilty all over again. To reach that point, we have to be able to let go of the story that hurt us as a part of an emotional burden we're carrying. And that's not easy to do. It's not a process you just do like that. I'm going to decide to forgive and let go. As Laurie said, forgive and forget. Mm, it sometimes doesn't happen like that. There's people who carry that burden for years and years and years. The guilt and the rage accumulate and grow in those people. They revisit the stories over and over and over again. And every time they revisit the story, they somehow make it stronger and mightier because they give it their emotion again. And that's why in, at the Institute, we help people approach their past and the stories that hurt them from three different perspectives, intellectual, emotional, and what we call absolute forgiveness, in which we combine everything that Mavis said in a process that is uh, established step by step, accompanying the person in the whole process so very gently, very carefully, and with a lot of support, the person can decide to work through whatever happened in a way that they feel ready to let it go. Because only when the story doesn't bring back all that negativity and all those negative feelings, can we truly say that a person has forgiven. The last thing that I want to add is something that many people sometimes refuse to accept or might not feel comfortable accepting, which is that when you forgive, you're actually doing it on your own and for yourself, even if you think you're forgiving somebody for something they did. Many times the people who hurt you don't give a hoot whether you forgive them or not. They don't care. They're not even thinking about you, even if you spend most of your days thinking about them. Forgiveness is therefore a process that is focused on you, on your feelings, on your memories. And you're the only one who can complete that process of forgiveness. 
The person who abused you cannot complete it, even if they accept that you forgave them. That will not change your process unless you're willing to do it. Therefore, forgiveness is an individual, personal act. And accepting and understanding that it's sometimes hard because people find what Mavis said, that by forgiving the abuser, you're somehow condoning or accepting that what they did is right or acceptable, acceptable, and that's not it at all. Forgiving is a process by which you let the story go. You let those emotions vanish from your day to day to day. You stop revisiting the past to feel bad about it. So all in all, forgiving is a process that you have to undertake on your own with support and help if you want it, but not together with the abuser necessarily. It's something you need to do. And that's how we approach forgiveness at the Institute and try to help people take every step of the process so they can finally let all those stories go. And this is what I wanted to share with you all. I will now open the floor to have the previous two speakers with me on the screen. Remember, those of you who are watching this, that you can write your questions and your comments online so we can include them in the conversation. I will now start asking the questions that we have prepared at the Institute for our speakers. In this part of the process, I will ask the question. It's the same question for the three of us, and together we will try to give a very complete answer so those who are watching us can get different perspectives and opinions. The first question is, what are, in your opinion, the key elements of forgiveness? I think, Mavis, you already gave us your elements. Is there anything else you would like to add about those elements? Do you think that some of those elements are more important than others? Do you think that maybe uh, there are other elements that some people might find lacking or that they should focus on? Is there anything else you would like to add about those elements? I just want to highlight, Jessica, the importance of really facing our emotions because there's there's a difference between replaying them and revisiting them and feeling them versus facing them with tenderness and really validating why it is that we feel so hurt and so betrayed. I find that often it's harder to forgive when there is not a heartfelt apology from the person who hurt mm -hmm. us. And so it's up to us to really validate. It makes sense that you feel so angry and so hurt and to not move that process faster than it needs to go. What I was saying about spiritual bypassing. I think forgive and forget is part of that spiritual bypassing. It's like we're each on our own forgiveness journey and sometimes it will take a lot longer for some people than for others. And another element that I want to highlight is that when we feel ready, it's very important to try to understand the perspective of the person who hurt us and what, what their history is, what their motivations are. Often when we're deeply hurt by someone's actions, they're actually showing us, they're making us feel what they're feeling inside. They're, they're reacting in a way that's making us viscerally feel why they're, they're treating us the way that they did. It's not universally the case, but sometimes that may be happening, that they're actually either suffering because of something we did to them or they're suffering because of their own histories. I think that's all I want to say for now about the key points. Great. Thank you, Mavis. Lori, what's your take on this? What do you think are the key elements? <clears throat> there's a there's a few things, and I really love what you're saying, Mavis, about the need to face our emotions, because I think, and, and Jessica, I think you alluded to this as well, 
I think when we don't engage with our emotional sensations, with our emotional, like how it actually impacts us somatically, how does it show up in our body? And it's there and we don't even realize that it's there. The more that we try to push it down, the bigger that it gets and the louder it gets. But it may not be in your waking hours, as you said, right? It may come in the nightmares. It may come in the, you know, just all of a sudden overwhelm. And I think the issue is what we're trying to do is is to work with the emotions so that they won't overwhelm us. So we need to be able to be in a space where we can engage safely and, 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 you know, I used to, I'm a science geek. So back to high school chemistry, where we would titrate things to try and get the right pH. We wanted the solution to be clear instead of pink or blue. It's the same idea of titrating these emotional overwhelms so that they don't hijack us in such a way. And I think that there's a couple other things that, that I think are true in terms of in being able to forgive. I think that you have to be in a space where more than one thing can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I can be incredibly hurt. I can be betrayed. I can be um, perpetrated against. And, you know, as Mavis was saying, taking into account the history of the individual or the culture or, you know, whatever the perpetrator's profile is that I can, I can make room for more than one thing to be true at the same time that there was, there was a collective, there was a stew that somebody has been simmering and boiling in for such a long time that has, has spilled over now onto me. And, you know, how can I hold both of those truths? And I have to be able to, because it doesn't allow for me to have my emotional response if I can't have two things being true. And it's external and it's internal because we'll have parts of ourselves that do want to, you know, move on or they want to forgive or they want, and then there's another part internally. It's like, absolutely not. I will not So we have to be able to, I think, recognize each of these different experiences, be able to engage with them and be able to bring them into, you know, a space together. Like I said, that's the internal work that I think Mavis is talking about. And then there is this this macro or, or collective work that needs to be done as well. So I think that those that those elements of being able to engage but being able to hold that more than one thing can be true. And I think it's difficult for people to forgive. And I know on my own forgiveness journey, right? It is very difficult for me to forgive if there is no space in the collective the interaction or whatever for both of us to be present. So if someone's coming at you, you did and you did, you know, and, and, you know, and, and there's no room for both of you to be present. I find it very hard in my own journey to let go of that. Right. Because it puts my defenses back up. Right. It's like, if I can't be present, then it makes it really hard to forgive and to be present. So that's that's kind of my take is more than one thing has to be true. There has to be space for those things to be to be in the environment or in the collective to kind of interact with one another. And then you can't allow that emotional thing to come in and overwhelm. So you have to have something on board that when those you know, really powerful words of guilt or shame or, or abandonment or abuse or neglect, when any of those really powerful words come online, that you have the resources to help them not overwhelm and take over. So there's my nutshell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. I agree with both of you, which is why I said all in our opinion, Uh, In humanology, we say that all forgiveness processes that um, really reach absolute forgiveness include that intellectual part, which is maybe making, finding logic in what happened or analyzing the situation in a cognitive way. 
and then also the emotional part that needs to face all the emotions, as Mavis said, at the person's pace and as the person progresses, because there are certain steps that you can't take unless you're taken, you've taken the other ones first. You're not ready for them. And you have to let go of things very slowly sometimes. And uh, in order to do that, I think there's an element that needs to be present in every single case, which is a basic level of self-love. Sometimes people find it difficult to forgive because there's not enough self-love, because they feel so trashed, so hurt, so damaged, that they find no self-respect and no love of themselves to build upon. And sometimes we first need to start helping the person recover that self-love so that forgiveness can be built onto that. And uh, without that, I think that any forgiveness is doomed to fail. We need to build that first, I think. And um, this doesn't only have to do with individual forgiveness. We are currently seeing, as has historically always been sadly so, many cases of terrible wars raging in the world and uh, whole societies suffering and people dying and very, very difficult situations. And I think that self-love also in groups and communities is important if we want to find forgiveness. You know, the love of the community, the love of the group, the love is also important if we want to forgive. So that is my nutshell. That is the element that I wanted to add to everything else that you both, Mavis and Laurie, contributed. I think all of these elements are important, but without self-love, I think it would be very difficult to forgive. The second question that we have right now, yes, Mavis, do you wanted to say something? I do. I just, okay. I, I agree with you that self-love is such an important concept. And yet when people don't have self-love, it's nearly impossible for them to, to somehow manufacture it. So when I'm working with people on self-love, I really focus on the idea of how do you allow other people's love and positive regard of you in because that's that's what's missing i mm -hmm. i don't think that you can just say okay i'm gonna love myself now it's it's this process of really learning how to surround yourself with people who hold you with love and to figure out how it is that you allow that love to come in so when I work with my clients who struggle with self-love, I actually focus on the process of what are you doing right now to block the love that I feel for you? How are you avoiding what's happening between us? How are you, how are you avoiding the care that I'm trying to show for you? And it's, really fascinating what people tell me so they can they can actually like physically close their hearts so that they're not feeling anything or I had one person say to me I count backwards from a thousand subtracting by sevens so I go 1,993 800 like 97 and, and I'm going wow okay and then another person said they they look at me and they shrink me down into like a tiny little dot and put me on the ground so that that's just a fascinating perspective that I've developed in working with my clients it's just understanding what they do to protect themselves from feeling loved because it's likely that they've been hurt greatly in the context of relationships where they should have been loved. 
Totally, totally. I didn't explain how we yeah. go about rebuilding self-love yeah. because that would be, I think, a complete new human conversation <laughs> and a very interesting one. Maybe we should organize another one because that's a very, very important topic too. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with you, Mavis. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you the second question. The second question says, forgiving another member of your family and forgiving another country, for example, in times of war, might sound very different, but are they? How are they same? How are they the same and how are they different? Laurie, would you like to take this one on first? Sure. You know, I, I think it's always really important to, I mean, having had the privilege of living in, in multiple countries and seeing the, the richness of lived experience. So when you ask, you know, about forgiveness from, you know, country to country versus, and to me, I, you know, I take, you know, I call it the micro and the macro, right? And then, you know, seeing what has happened here in the United States, as we've had such critical um, moments of, of just crystallization of so many years of, of outrageous treatment and um, behaviors. And, you know, again, I think during the pandemic, you know, when we were all kind of, you know, sequestered, you know, internally and, and watching things like, you know, George Floyd's murder and Black Lives Matter and having very different conversations than maybe we had had collectively. And I don't know that the elements are different, but I do believe that the enormity of forgiveness for the macro is um, much more complicated, more complicated, much more complex. So again, I don't think the dynamics of, but you know, when when you have communities who for centuries, millennia, have been have been marginalized, have been isolated, have been downtrodden. And then to think that all of a sudden, you know, well, we're going to build up, you know, your, your clout, we're going to make things equal. We're going to, you know, and, you know, it's, you know, again, I'm thinking kind of even about like say self-love. If you are inside the community, the love inside the community for your identity is very strong. And you know, collectively, you know, when we when we want to try and make a correction, and we think about things, you know, I mean, I've I've learned, I, I've I've been privileged to learn by some absolutely amazing mentors through some of these years about, you know, what's your role? What's your role in in healing? Because forgiveness is really about to me, and I hate that word healing, because it's like, it's, it's like this ethereal thing we're moving towards is like, what exactly does that mean? But moving into a state where you're, you're, you're more harmonious with what's going on around you and the people around you. But you know, when, when a particular class of individuals have been your perpetrators for so long, you know, how do you begin to make a connection at a micro level, right? So what is, you know, what is the role? What is the role of, of the individuals in a collective, in a macro um, space? So they are different to me. Again, I think that, that maybe the, the ideas and the ethoses are similar and and that when you do work that you're you are working i think it, you know you make your contribution at a micro level right i make my contribution you know through what i can affect which is my being present i certainly can try and raise my voice in my community i certainly can try and be um an educator when others who have been subjected to the marginalization, to the abuses don't have, you know, and, and in my community, we talk about spoons and spoon theory. So, you know, how many spoons do you have? Because each day the concept is you only have so many. When you wake up, you only have so many spoons. And sometimes the, the job that you're having to do is to try and empty the ocean with your spoon. 
So that takes a collective, right? And I'm going to have more spoons than some of the, the communities that I work with because I don't, I pass, I pass. Say in the neurodivergent community, I pass. People don't look at me and say, oh, she's neurodivergent because they don't know what goes on inside me, but I pass and I know how to do that. And that also means that sometimes I have more spoons and I can get into a community and I can teach and I can educate and I can try and bring others into a more informed um, and maybe more empathetic space for the lived experience. And so, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's a complex question, similar elements, but it's not the same. I just don't think it's the same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laurie. Mavis, what would you say? At the moment, I'm sitting with what you're saying, Laurie, about micro versus macro and I'm actually pausing on you saying that you pass and the power and the pain of that simple statement, I pass. Yeah, so just, I just want to acknowledge that. Jessica, a very, very complex question. So, I think that there are certain similarities between forgiving a member of your family versus forgiving another country in that the essence of forgiveness is rooted in, in our human emotions. It's rooted in empathy. Well, first of all, before we get to empathy, it's, it's rooted in the intensity and complexity of the emotions that we're feeling. And then it involves empathy. It involves in the very complex journey of letting go and moving forward. So in both situations, we've got those elements. Our intense emotions, the need for empathy, the decision to try to move forward, and, and their beneficial outcomes, whether it's the micro or the macro level using uh, Lori's terms. So at the personal level, it can lead to our mental and emotional healing and well-being. And for nations, it can involve in peace treaties, renewed diplomatic relations, collaborative growth. There are also moral and ethical considerations in both the personal and, and the more global disputes, both types of forgiveness involve moral and ethical introspection, and, and we just have to grapple with questions about justice and righteousness and the greater good. The differences are in scale and complexity. So forgiving a family member or another person, it's just, it's one-on-one -on -one dynamics and forgiving another country, it's so much more complex, obviously. You know, in, especially in times of war, it involves just layers of multiple, multiple complexity with lots of stakeholders, histories and political considerations. And I heard Lori talk about a personal versus a collective. You know, personal memories are very different from collective memories. So national forgiveness is, is just rooted in collective memory. It's just, it can be passed down through generations and it makes the process much more complex. There's also direct versus indirect impact when it's involving a collective, what we're being called on to forgive. It, it's not necessarily because we've been directly harmed but we can feel the pain through our national identity, through our shared culture, or through a patriotic sentiment. 
and in terms of the individual versus the international the reconciliation process uh, can be very different so on an international level it's it's gonna it may involve diplomatic negotiations reparations peace treaties uh, it's a lot more complicated and on an international level there's there's the influence of external narratives like media propaganda political agendas that can either hinder or facilitate the forgiveness process so personal forgiveness is much less likely to be influenced by such large scale external narratives and in terms of duration the act of us forgiving an individual might be relatively quick compared to forgiving a country which can take decades or even centuries and it can span multiple generations so the essence of forgiveness remains the same in that personally and internationally they're both rooted in human emotions and empathy and the complex journey of letting go and moving forward but on an international level it's so much more complex I agree with both again. I just want to add that I said at the beginning in my presentation that forgiveness is a personal individual action. It's my own responsibility if I forgive, if I choose to forgive, and if I finally forgive. Whereas forgiving another country, for example, in times of war, as we said, requires the choosing to forgive of many, many, many people and the uh, joint actions of many, many, many people. And in that sense, as Mavis just said, we have all these external elements that affect us and that even sometimes come from long time ago and affect all of us, not just our country, but the opposite country as well, because there's, there's stories on both and uh, sometimes forgiving in society requires an important change in the way in which our own story is being told. If we want a society to forgive another society or another group, our own general story as a group has to change. And it's not just one person's story, but the whole group. And changing a group story is no easy feat. And it needs um, a lot of sharing, a lot of uh, creating, co-creating together, so that little by little, this new vision of the other group starts changing. I think that can only be achieved when we have a joint vision and in personal forgiveness is just our own vision. And I think that makes it, as Mavis said, so much more complex. We have to work individually, but also together if we want to reach a global or group forgiveness. And that requires different techniques that are not the, the ones that we use for personal forgiveness. And I think experts and professionals are also needed to help guide those who express their will to forgive. And <clears throat> like anything else in societies, it needs to spread and grow. And the more people are willing to forgive, the faster it will move and the easier it will become. But starting that, that new change is always very difficult because changing a people's mentality, of course, is a very difficult, long process, but it has to start. And if we don't start it, and if we don't try to forgive as individuals that spread that will to change, then nothing will change. So I think there needs to be that element there that we don't need in personal forgiveness. And uh, it needs the support of many 
And to get that support and to gain that support, we need convictions and beliefs. And that's something we need to work on. Whereas in personal individual forgiveness, where it's just one person's set of beliefs that need to be questioned and maybe changed. So I think that's also important to, to consider when we talk about forgiving other countries or other groups of people. And this leads me to the third question, which is, is forgiving different from culture to culture? How? Well, Laurie, you already mentioned that you had the, the great opportunity to live in different places and uh, get to know different cultures and you do see differences. You already hinted at that. Do you want to explore that a little bit further? Sure. Well, I, I do believe that, that um, forgiveness is different from culture to culture because I think it's based on your lived experience. And the lived experience that you will have um, in, in the multitude of cultures that exist globally, you know, as a woman, as a person of color, as a darker skinned person of color, as a uh, queer individual, as a neurodivergent individual, all of these different experiences will manifest and therefore show up culturally differently. So um, if, if we're going to try and honor that lived experience, right? Um, and everything that, that culturally you were brought up with it. So what does it mean to be, you know, a woman? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be queer? What does it mean to be non-binary? What does it mean to be transgendered? What does it mean? And that's, and that's just talking about one particular sort of column of, of things that we would be looking at. Um, so, you know, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Culturally to culture, it, you know, forgiveness is different. And I think in a lot of cultures, you're not allowed to question things, you know, it is that forgive and forget. It's that spiritual bypass that Mavis is talking about where you just, you know, well, based on, based on who you are, based on your, your social position, you, you don't have a right to be upset about something. You should be grateful that you've gotten any little crumb here or that, you know, we, we are letting you exist or we're letting you serve us or whatever <laughs> dynamic is. So, um, yeah, I, culture to culture. Absolutely. And then I think when you bring your lived experience into this multitude of cultures that are out there and then you kind of, you know, run headlong into them, um, you know, it's it's very interesting. I know that, you know, Stephen, some of the things that we're talking about in right here, right? When we talk, you know, we three represent, I think, very different lived experiences in our work. So we're in very similar fields. We're doing very similar things. But if you were to look behind our names, we all have very different letters behind our names. And I will tell you that, you know, when I was just a parent, that I had absolutely no standing. It was so frustrating. And the things that I share as now someone with a master's degree, you know, and, you know, and again, you, so there's just this hierarchy culturally. So absolutely. And, and then how do we hold these things? How do we hold these lived experiences and honor them? And what do we do when we run headlong into something, you know, as a woman, if we were to walk into certain cultures, our voices would not be heard. They would not be welcome. So um, I, I think there's just so many elements that you look at. And, you know, as a, as a therapist, you know, I, I serve a multitude of cultures in my practice. I am so honored that people trust me to be on the journey, but you have got to hold a place of extreme humility because culturally what exists inside one family unit is not going to be the same as my lived experience. And so um, it's just, it's a piece that I just don't think we um, educate our children enough on, right? That we, that we talk enough about that um, there's just a richness that's out there and then there's an understanding that needs to come with it and all of those multitude of lived experiences. So 
Yeah. Um, I just want to clarify what it is that we don't teach our children enough about, Lori. It's the concept of lived experiences and how different they are. I think that the concept of, of culture, the concept of, yeah, so I mean, it, just defining lived experiences, yes, it is that we don't teach them enough about lived experiences, but then like, what, how are we defining that word, right? So in this particular instance, you know, I think it's just really interesting. And I wish, I wish that it was curriculum for the world that everybody had to live in another culture, some place where you you didn't know the language, some place where you didn't know all the cultural norms of what you were supposed to do, because I think it opens your brain in a different way to then when you return to maybe your home culture, which is, you know, what I did, you, you look at things so differently because you have had the opportunity to live outside of your cultural norm. And then I think you have a broader perspective of what that even means. I think it gives you a broader perspective about world politics or, you know, governmental transgressions and, you know, the cultures and et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I mean, Mavis, is, is sort of the cultural lived experience, but just the richness of what that means. I, I so love maybe, the idea. Yeah, I love the idea requiring everyone to live in a different culture <laughs> i mean even if you could just do it in a classroom i mean wouldn't it be great like you know like you just took a year and you just each, each class this is all we do right we only we only speak this language that's not your mother tongue and you need yeah. to figure out how to navigate inside this you need to figure out how you're going to get your homework in or you're going to you know navigate an issue with the administration or it's and it's and again I don't want to to you know th there are multiple ways that we experience living in in other cultures right it's it's one thing to have to flee your country and you know to be in a chaotic state of of total dysregulation and and just stress and chaos or the way that I got to experience another culture which was you know to come in as an expat I had a I had a colleague tell me, you know, well, here in the United States, we don't have expats, you know, we only have immigrants. I'm like, well, we actually do have expats, but, yeah, you, but you know, it's <laughs> something that we don't necessarily, you know, talk about. But just like, you know, in other, you know, because other countries, they have expats. No, other countries have immigrants, you know, I mean, so again, understanding and, and you know, and really wanting to name the privilege that you know, I had to experience that. It was very civilized and very calm and there were more people around to help me. But when you are fleeing for your life, that's, that's another ball game completely. So yeah, I just, I wish, I wish, that, I wish that we had more of an opportunity to experience being someplace that's not home. I would like to get back to this topic once Mavis answers the question because I would like to ask you a little bit more about this and I would like the opinion of the two of you but Mavis do you think it's different for giving for, uh, in one country or in one culture versus another one absolutely and I'm hoping that we can hear from our audience on this because yeah. we have I think a, a very international audience and so mm -hmm. I can talk about this from my own perspective. I think it's wonderful that all three of us have, have lived in different cultures. So in terms of my personal experience with different cultures, uh, I definitely think that cultural nuances and traditions play a significant role in shaping how forgiveness is perceived and practiced. So I've been exposed to people from different religious and philosophical foundations. And, you know, for example, Christianity really emphasizes the importance of forgiving others as God forgives sin. And in Buddhism, forgiveness is tied to the principle of compassion and releasing of suffering. And so that's, that's one way that I've been 
exposed to different cultures. There's also collectivist versus individual cultures. Mm -hmm. So in collectivist cultures like parts of Asia and Africa and Central and South America, the harmony of the group is really, really prioritized. And forgiveness might be encouraged to maintain group cohesion, even if individual feelings haven't been completely resolved. And so, you know, I, I come from an Asian culture and there's also the concept of like honor and shame and, and you don't, you just don't lose face or you bring shame on the family. And, and there's just such a priority that I've experienced growing up on. You, you just don't make a fuss about things. You just harmonize and, and go on. Whereas in the United States, it's, I think there's more of a focus on guilt and personal responsibility and forgiveness seems to be more about individual introspection and atonement. And, and then as we were talking about, there's just the whole historical and political concept that's, that's wrapped up in, in cultures and collective experiences like colonization and wars or shared traumas. It, it just totally influences how culture perceives forgiveness. And I, I am a third culture kid. I was born in the US, but I was taken to Spain as a kid and I grew up in Spain, but then I went back to the US and I lived, I've already lived in eight different countries and in many different places in those eight different countries. So I'm a real third culture kid. And as such, I think I have a, quite a unique perspective because I'm neither nor. I'm not uh, really American, I'm not really Spanish, I'm nothing, but I'm everything at the same time. And I think I, I experienced the differences in forgiving on my own flesh and blood, uh, having lived in those different countries, because the way people approach forgiving or forgiveness in each country is so very different. And this leads me to the question that I wanted to ask the two of you. Do you think that the internet and globalization has somehow helped the world understand the other types of forgiveness better? Or do you think it has done more harm than good? I mean, do you think that now that we have the internet and we watch people from all around the world and we watch their, their shows on Netflix and we get to see a little bit of their culture, do you think this is helping forgiveness be an easier process in cultures in general? Or do you think it's somehow getting people to defend their own beliefs more strongly? <laughs> that's a that's a really good question, Jessica. Laura, you yeah, want to you, you want to? You, you were talking. You were talking about <laughs> this, and it inspired me. Question: What about globalization? Is it being good or is it being bad for us? Laura, you want to answer this first, or, or you want me to? Well, I I think this is another one of those situations where more than one thing can be true at the same time. Yeah. Right. So. I think it's really important when you think about, you know, yeah, you can stream a show on Netflix and you can see somebody's culture, but are you truly seeing somebody's culture or are you simply seeing a slice of it? And then you say, oh, well, this is, you know, the way everyone there is. It's, it's, you know, what's representation? What, what, and, you know, and it's, it's really interesting too, because on the internet, everybody has a megaphone right? Everybody has an opportunity to share, uh, uh, you know, before <laughs> we had the internet, right? You're, if your story didn't get picked up by the global news, or if your story, you know, I mean, how, how things, how information got propagated um, was suspect. <laughs> but um because I mean, I think it was much easier to have propaganda. I think it was much easier to have a particular narrative because it was controlled by so few. And now the narrative is not controlled by so few. And I think that there's a lot about that that's very empowering. 
And I also think there's a lot about that that can be really confusing and can be um, polarizing and dangerous and unhealthy. And so um, has it helped? Yes. Has it hurt? Yes. Is that a cop-out answer? Maybe, but um, no, no, I, think I think they're both true. <laughs> I think I think it's a very true answer. And I wonder if it doesn't depend on the open-mindedness of the individual who's being exposed to the internet. Because I, I see all three of us, and I imagine the audience who's watching this as being really open-minded people. So I think we're more likely to benefit from the global aspects of the internet. But if someone has a more narrow viewpoint, then they're more likely to use the information that they receive to engage in confirmation bias. So I agree that both can be true. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was thinking about my kids, for example. You know, I have two children. Uh, both of them have grown up as um, third culture kids as well. My eldest was born in Spain and lived in six different countries. My youngest was born in Kazakhstan. We adopted her when she was a baby, but she also lived in many different countries. And their perspective on forgiveness is very different from mine because it's a topic we were discussing a few days ago <laughs> when they came to visit our new home here in Spain. And... Uh, it was funny because my daughter is really, really interested in Asian cultures because she comes from Kazakhstan. I guess there is this interest that she has and she is more, uh, a little bit more, um, how did you call it before Mavis? Mm, she's less individualistic than my son. And I think that could also be a learned trait in this case because she feels closer to Asian cultures than my son does, I think that is something she somehow incorporated in her, into her own forgiving or any other kind of process. So I agree that it could help and there's a confirmation bias there, but I think it's important to realize that unless we're exposed to other forms of living, we will only be able to live according to the one we know. So we need to see and experience other things so we can incorporate at least some of those things into our own lives. I think that's important. And I think the internet has at least given us that opportunity, even if it's with glimpses and uh, you know little uh, views, even if it's just a show on Netflix, but it might open our curiosity to learn a bit more. Perhaps, you know, I remember my son always dreaming of going to an American university. He wanted to go to the US and go to university because he idolized university based on what he saw on TV and in movies. And then he grew up and his view changed. But for many years, the way he saw the world was, of course, through that bias, through that lens that he had on when he was watching the shows. And in spite of which, he learned a lot about American culture too. So I think, as you said, it's both good and bad. We have a question from our audience. I'm going to just launch it here. You can just respond. It's not directed to one person. It says, thank you very much to all participants. Truly inspiring comments. Could any of you share any real forgiveness experience or process that was successful? What was the key for success? So a case for us to share. Would either of you want to take it this on first? I love this question. And in fact, this person read my mind because <laughs> before before we started, I, I said, I, I really, I would like to hear from the panel members uh, a case of a successful forgiveness journey and also a place where you're stuck in your forgiveness journey. So 
this audience member was kind enough to, to ask us about a success journey in forgiveness. Would either one of you like to take that or you want me to go first? As you wish, Mavis. I can share something, but being the organizer, I think I should always speak last. <laughs> so go I, for it. I think being the organizer, you should speak first because you've been going last. So go ahead. I want, I want That's why I always go last because I try to give my <laughs> my guests the opportunity to express themselves first, which I, I want to. I want to hear. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay, Jessica. I can I can tell you a very personal story uh, that took a lot of work on myself because you asked for a personal uh, forgiveness story. When I was twenty one years old, my father confessed that the day I was born, he went, he was in the hospital waiting for me to be born. And when the nurses were going to give me to him, he had this very strong internal feeling inside of him that made him reject me. Like, you know, that sometimes happens to us when we meet someone we never met before, but we feel this internal either attraction or rejection that we can make no sense of? Well, he told me that he felt that and that it never went away. <laughs> that whenever he had to get close to me, he had that feeling, that internal struggle that he had to fight against. I remember listening to my dad and then like my mind just turning and turning I'm putting some pieces together. I remember telling him, gosh, now I understand so many things. Because for 21 years, I had, of course, been blaming myself. I thought there was something wrong with me. And I thought that's why my father was never close to me or why he rejected me. Or, And when he confessed that, even though I didn't fully understand it because it was new to me, it made sense in a way and it somehow gave me an intellectual understanding that took the guilt away from me. Well, many years later and having studied and learned as much as I did in, in, my, in my own personal journey, I managed to go through first that intellectual forgiveness, then the emotional one until absolute forgiveness. And I completely, totally, totally forgave my father because I understand that the same way it came to him that day when he saw me, there was nothing he could do. I mean, it was something that he experienced and he shared with me 21 years later, but it was a heavy burden for him, something he had to carry his whole life until he passed. And it must have been very hard to have a child you couldn't stand or you couldn't feel close to, you know? in your life, in your family, in your environment. I am really happy to say that my father sharing that piece of information with me made it possible for me to forgive and um, to start the whole process of forgiveness. And it made me understand so many more people, why some people react the way they do, uh, it actually led to one of the discoveries in humanology, which is something that we call personal essence that I don't have the time to discuss right here, but it led to that and to as understanding human beings in a slight different way that helps us make sense of many relationships among people. So that's one example in this particular case to the person who asked the question. I think that the key was first that understanding, intellectual understanding, and then second, the whole learning process that I went through, putting the pieces together like a puzzle until it all made sense and helped me let the story go. I can tell the story now without any pain, without any guilt. I treasure many memories with my father. This one memory in particular, I treasure because he taught me so much. And I think 
It was also the beginning of a new relationship with him. He told me in that conversation that he could never love me, but he was so proud of me. He never thought he could be any prouder. So that created a different type of relationship. There you go with a very, very personal story, Mavis. <laughs> yes, Jessica, I am so glad that I asked you to go first because that's an incredibly powerful story of forgiveness. And I'm just, I'm having just all kinds of emotions inside listening to you. And I'm thinking about what an act of love it was for your father to tell you about his struggle because that just, like you said, it, it just helped all the pieces of the puzzle fall in place and it took you out of the role of there's something wrong with me. I, I, I just, I have goosebumps thinking about the story. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. I'm just so glad you told us. Well, that's the story I shared. Would either of you like to answer the question or <laughs> should we move on? <laughs> Are there, are there any other questions from the audience? Not yet. Um, today, people are not very active in the, in the chat, but I do have more questions, if I may, unless I, you have questions too. I, I, would, I would like to hear a personal anecdote of where we've been stuck uh -huh. in our forgiveness journey. Well, I certainly, I certainly have a have a stuck story, and then Mavis, maybe you can kind of share, you know, your perspective on on one or the other as well, because I do think that there's something really interesting about sort of all of the, the different pieces, and maybe I think it would also enlighten why we're answering the questions, the bigger, higher questions, maybe the way we do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think I get very stuck in those spaces where I feel like I'm not allowed to be present. So that those, those moments of, um, you know, and, and I talk a lot because I feel like there are layers that, that things occur at. So, you know, I think there's the, this transactional layer you did this and you did that and you hurt, you know, and I'm not saying that those things aren't real, right? I mean, everything that happened at the transactional layer did happen and it's real, but it fell down, trickled down into this like emotional space. And that to me is where the forgiveness happens. And when we get stuck up in the transactional layer, you did this and you did that and you can't do that and you can't say that and you can't, you know, if I get stuck in the transactional layer and it isn't possible for me to feel like I can be present in that more sort of emotional state, and it's not about trying to make excuses. That's not, you know, I mean, like rationalizations. It's not about trying to rationalize. It's about here's where I was in that moment. And, you know, I wasn't seen right? I wasn't heard. Um, in my practice, I talk about creating safety. And I think that, you know, a lot of times parents will ask me, well, how do I create safety? And, you know, I give them three really simple first steps to create safety. You have to be able to see somebody. And it doesn't mean that I see that you're in the room, but it's that I see you. I mean, physically, somatically, sensory, you know, I, I, I see what's going on. I may not fully understand it, but I can see there's dysregulation. There's something that is, is challenging in that moment, or you're, you, you know, you're a people and you're just like, oh, yeah, it's so great. just be seen. And the second step is to be heard. Because if you're really seen and you let somebody know that you see them, they're going to be more likely to talk to you. And when they do, you need to sit still. And the, my clients, it was very cute because we were trying to come up with what is that third step. And we could never land on exactly the right word. And so we all decided collectively that we were going to call it tedding in English because all of the words ended with ted. 
So I needed to feel respected. I needed to feel validated. I needed to feel accepted. And it doesn't mean that I am agreeing, but I am tedding. So if you can be seen, if you can be heard, and you can be tedded, you can show up in a in a more safe way. And if we can show up in a safe way, right, then there's the room to connect and co-create some kind of forgiveness or some kind of presence. So for me, I get stuck when I feel like that part of me can't be present. So if I'm, you know, if I'm hurt and I'm angry, or whatever it is, right? And there is a, there, you know, and, and maybe I have done something that, you know, has been a transgression as well. It's very hard for me to step out of that space if I can't be present to. And again, it's not about making excuses. I will totally own my part of it, but I can't. And I hate the word, but I try not to use the word, but I remember when I was a little girl, we were told you're not allowed to say, but. So I try to use the word and. So instead of, but right. If I can't be present, it makes it really hard for me to, to have that. And word and. Right. And, and we both heard each other. So how are we going to move to that space? And that's I'm talking about something that's like at the at the individual level. That's not a, a collective level. But um, any time that I've been stuck and I certainly, you know, that I have I have like one in particular in my life where there's someone that I was very close to and we had a massive blowout two years ago. We still haven't spoken. It hurts me greatly. and. I can't show up because there's not room to be present in, in the dynamic because we both owe each other some forgiveness. So that's where I get stuck. Really Thank powerful. you. Lauren. Yeah. I, I want to respect your, the time. So there are only three minutes left. Do you want me to go very quickly? What would you like, Jessica? Yes, please. I, I have a story of how I was both stuck for decades and finally managed to move to forgiveness. It was my sister who I just felt like she was never, she was just never the big sister I wanted. And it was, as you were saying, all this, uh, Lori, like you did this and you didn't do this. And, and she was just never there for me. When my son was born, she sent me a card with a hundred dollar check and she just never showed up for anything important in my life and and finally I I wrote her this letter and rather than telling her I mean I, I re, there's a lot of processing that I did on my own and I decided to write her a letter of apology for how I was never the sister to her that she wanted and it took so much introspection on my part and uh, it it broke it just broke through our impasse when I did that and yeah it took so much like humility on my part to look at how did I contribute to this and, and to admit I wasn't the greatest little sister to her either and and one example that I started with was I was planning a wedding and I gave her like nine months notice. They said, my wedding is going to be on June 22nd. Can you, can you come? And she said, uh, I, I booked a cruise. Can you change the date of your wedding? And I said, no, I'm not going to change the date of my wedding. But you can see how that was an act on my part that was pretty insensitive to her and contributed to our distance. Thank you, Mavis. Thank you to both. I think this is a beautiful note to end today's human conversation. I had a lot of questions also on self-forgiveness, which is something we haven't really touched upon, and I think is an important topic too, but we'll have to leave it for another human conversation. 
It's been really, really insightful and inspiring to have you both ladies in our show tonight. I am sure that even though people didn't mention that many things online today, they will, and they will watch it and they will write their comments and their questions. We invite everyone who does watch the show to do that. And I'll uh, send you the questions and comments, or you can also log on and read them and answer them. Feel free to. I want to thank both of you for taking the time and making the effort to be here with us tonight and for inspiring a lot of people in the world to try and forgive a little bit more. And uh, with this, I'm going to announce the next uh, human conversation, which will happen the 20th of November. We will be talking about the another very important human topic, motivation, and the title will be reignite your motivation so be on the watch out for our information so you can connect and watch our next human conversation on the topic of reigniting your motivation thank you very much everyone i'm jessica lockhart this is human conversations by the international institute of humanology have a wonderful month 